Hey, good morning. It's so good to be with you again. Uh, today we're going to look at Psalm 119 again, and we're going to begin at verse 17. This is the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Gimel. Uh, before we look at God's word, let's pray and ask God uh, to give us understanding. Father, we thank you so much uh, that you've given us your word, uh, that your word feeds and nourishes us, uh, that your word strengthens us uh, to live for you and to respond rightly in a sin-cursed world. Father, we ask this morning that you would uh, open our eyes so that we can behold wonderful things uh, from your law, uh, so that by that we can better serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the psalmist here today is going to uh, express to us the fact that he's dealing with enemies in his life, that there are people aligned against him, aligned against God's word, and he's suffering a trial because of this. And this is somewhat of a theme that repeats itself in Psalm 119, uh, that we have to deal with enemies in this sin-cursed world. And so uh, as we look at this psalm, I want you to understand that when enemies attack, we need to trust in God as we live according to his word. So I hope you have your Bible opened up. I want you to read along with me as we look at Psalm 119, beginning at verse 17. Be good to your servant while I live, that I, am a, that I may obey your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. You rebuke the arrogant who are accursed, those who stray from your commands. Remove from me their scorn and contempt, for I keep your statutes. Though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. Well, let's see what we can learn from, from this psalm this morning. The first thing I think we see is that the psalmist has a heavenly desire, and he has a heavenly desire because his mind is focused on and meditating on the Word of God. Look at verse 17. Um, and the reason I say heavenly desire, let me back up, is because in verse 19, he talks about being a stranger on the earth. So he's a stranger on the earth. He has this longing for heaven. And we see in verses 17 and 18 that the word of God gives him a desire uh, for the heavenly things. So verse 17, he says, Be good to your servant while I live, that I may obey the word of God. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things from your law. He calls himself God's servant here. And so he's referring to God as his Lord, his Lord in heaven. And as those who follow Jesus Christ as Lord, those who love our Father in heaven, uh, he wants us to grow in our intimate knowledge of him, uh, grow in our love for him. And we demonstrate the fact that we're growing in that love for God. How? By obeying his commands. If you love me, you will obey my commands. And, and just the way that God's created us, if we love somebody, we want to be with, with them. We want to be in their presence. In many cases, we want to be like them because we love them and we respect them. And so he says uh, that I may obey your word, that I may love you, God. Verse 18, he says something interesting. He says, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things in your law. And so the psalmist there is recognizing that his ability to know God in his word is dependent upon God, that God needs to open his eyes to give him understanding. Now, there's a doctrine of scripture, scripture called the perspicuity of scripture. And that means that everything we need to know about God and ourselves and Jesus Christ and salvation is clear in the Bible, that it's, it's something that we can understand. So he's not saying that okay, I just can't understand what you're saying, God. He is saying that I need to understand the significance of your word in my life so that I can grow in my love for you. And to understand the significance, significance, significance of God, then we need uh, what's called illumination. Uh, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit, uh, the word of God, because the word of God is spiritually understood. And so the psalmist understood that he needed God to open his eyes so that he could understand God's word, so that he could obey him, so that he could nourish this heavenly desire uh, for, for God. The second thing we see uh, in this psalm is that he has an earthly hunger for heavenly comfort. 
an earthly hunger for heavenly comfort. And we see that in verses 19 and 20, right? He shifts from this desire for God's word to a knowledge that he is on the earth and that, that he longs for heaven. Look at verse 19. I am a stranger on earth, right? And that's common in scripture. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. And Peter says we are aliens and strangers on the earth. Uh, we know as Christians that this is not our home. This is We're only passing through. Uh, this time that we spend on earth is is minuscule compared to eternity in heaven, right? And so he says, I'm a stranger here. And, and one aspect of being a stranger on earth is this, that David was trying to live according to the word of God. And the people around him, or I said David, the psalmist, whoever wrote the psalm, the psalmist recognizes that people around him aren't living according to the word of God. And so he feels alienated from people around him. He feels different than the people around him because he obeys the commands of God and they don't. So we see there in verse 20, uh, he says, My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. He had this, this earthly hunger. He wanted to be fed by the word of God. right? He wanted God to satisfy his desire for heaven. Right, We know in Scripture that we're told that we can't live by bread alone. We can't live by only earthly things. We have to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the psalmist certainly understands this, that as he lives as an alien and stranger on this earth, that his desire shouldn't be for earthly things. It shouldn't be for worldly things. And this is important as Christians, uh, just as practical Christian living. We have to watch out for what we are putting into our mind because if we're putting worldly things into our mind, we're cultivating a desire for the world. And if we're cultivating a desire for the world and not for heaven, then, then we're an enemy of God. Uh, that's what uh, First John says. And so he says, look, I have this hunger. I have, I'm consumed with this longing uh, for your laws at all time, at all times. And, and that is one distinction between a believer and an unbeliever. I know when I came to Christ, uh, as a freshman at the University of Georgia, um, I one of the first things that that helped me understand that I, I was a Christian was that all of a sudden I had a desire to read the Word of God. I went from never wanting to pick up the Word of God to placing my faith in Jesus Christ to desiring the Word of God. It's something I wanted. And that was because that moment that I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, God put His Spirit within me. And, and the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Spirit works in us through the Word. So it longs to transform us, and He transforms us as, as we interact with the Word of God. And so we should long for the Word, not for the world. So, so we need to cultivate a heavenly desire in, in, in on earth. We see that we need to, to find comfort in heavenly things, and that's found only in the Word of God. Now the next thing we see here in verse 21 is where the psalmist turns to what's causing him pain or affliction right now, and that's his enemies, okay? So let's look at this in verses 21 through 23. He says, You rebuke the arrogant who are accursed, those who stray from your commands. Remove them, remove from me their scorn and contempt, for I keep your statutes. The rulers sit together and slander me. Your servant will meditate on your decrees. So we see here the, the psalmist describes those uh, who are his enemies. The first thing he says is that they're arrogant. Verse 21, they're arrogant. They're proud. They've set themselves up as God, right? And, and they, they have no desire for the word of God. They're not living according to the word. They've made themselves God, and what they think is, what they think about, as far as how life should be lived, that becomes their word, okay? So they're arrogant, and they have scorn and contempt. They don't like the psalmist because the psalmist is doing everything he can to live according to the word of God. And friends, as, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, if we're attempting, if we're struggling to do our best to live according to the word of God, people in the world are not going to like us. They're not going to like the decisions we make. They're not going to like our worldview. And, and we're going to make them feel bad about themselves by the choices we make. Because by living righteously according to the word of God, our lives demonstrate that they're not living according to the word of God. And, and that's a problem, right? And so, so they, don't, they don't like us. As a matter of fact, they begin to hate us. They align themselves as our enemies. And then we see there in verse 23, uh, the rulers there, and, and the psalmist was dealing with people in leadership. The rulers slander, they slander him. Uh, they lie against him because they don't like uh, 
the way he's living. And so as you consider your life, um, we all have enemies uh, in this in this life that we live. Um, you know, at work, uh, maybe it's it's school, um, maybe even in your own family. There's there's a family member who hates the fact that you live your life according to the standards of the Word of God. They can't understand why you would do that. Why would you live according to an ancient text? Why would why would you believe uh, certain things about the world? And and they don't like that. It rubs them wrong, and they become your enemy. So um, as we consider our enemies, I think this text tells us that, that it's not our job to fight our enemies. Uh, we're going to have enemies in this life, but the text here shows us that it's God's job uh, to defeat our enemies. Look at verse 21. He says, you rebuke the arrogant, right? And then in verse 22, please remove uh, remove their scorn and contempt. So the psalmist is counting on God to deal with his enemies. And right, when an enemy lashes out against us, when an enemy slanders us, what's our first response, right? We want to go for their throat. We want to slander them as well. We want to do tit for tat, right? We want to feel good about ourselves by putting them in their place. And God says, no, it's my job to fight your enemies. Your job what is to, to love your enemies, right? Your job is res to respond according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why at the end there in verse 24, uh, after the psalmist describes his enemies, he says, your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors, right? So as, as those who live on this side of the cross, right? Those who, who can look back at the gospel portrayed there on the cross, right? That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day. As those who have placed their faith in that, we understand what? That Christ died for his enemies. That while we were still the enemies of Christ, God reconciled us to himself through the death of his son, right? Christ didn't die for people who were his friends. He died for those who are the enemies of God. And so really our response needs to flow out of a life that meditates on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't lash out against our enemies, right? What does Jesus say in Matthew 5? He says, hey, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Our job is not to lash out against our enemies. Our job is, is to meditate on the gospel and pray for God to fight our battles against our enemies. Now, I'm not saying that we never respond to our enemies uh, righteously, Okay, but, but we need to respond according to the word of God, and we need to, to respond uh, with a mind that's saturated by the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing what? That Christ died for you, an enemy of God, knowing that those people who are your enemies, it says in the psalm here, are a curse. They don't know Christ. They don't have the spirit of God living in them. And since, so that since they don't have the word of God living in them, they're not being transformed to love according to the gospel. We need to have compassion on our enemies because they're on the highway to hell. They need Jesus Christ. It doesn't, it doesn't help us at all to lash out against our enemies when we're supposed to be making disciples of them by proclaiming the love of Christ displayed in the gospel. So this morning, as you contemplate your enemies, understand that God is the one who's going to fight your battles for you. And as he fights your battles for you, you need to have a life saturated by the gospel of Jesus Christ knowing that you were once an enemy of God, and God made you his friend through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. That's an encouragement for you this morning as you head out into the world. Uh, as we go to prayer, I want to uh, pray again for the small family. Uh, I believe that uh, Jerry Small is going to be, uh, they're going to have a small grave, small graveside service uh, this morning because of what's going on. They can't have a funeral. And so just praying that, um, uh, that God and his love would comfort them uh, this is a time where you want the body of Christ around a family as they as they bury their loved one, um, and uh, you know I'm just praying that the Spirit of God would encourage them, and strengthen them in their faith and bring them comfort as He promises to. The other thing I want to pray about is uh, the people who are working in healthcare. Uh, I say that somewhat selfishly because when I leave here, I'm going into a nursing home, uh, and we have people with COVID-19, people that are sick. And they need to be taken care of. And I'm so thankful for the nurses in the nursing home that are there. Uh, they are interacting closely with these residents, loving them, giving them the care they need. And this is happening all over the country. And our healthcare workers need our prayers right now.
So please, if you would, join me in prayer and then pray for ourselves as we head out into a world where we have enemies. And then let's saturate our mind with the love of the gospel as we go out into the world. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much uh, that while we were your enemies, you reconciled us to yourself through the death of Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you for the great love of Jesus. And Father, as we interact with our enemies in this world, help us to remember that, that Christ died for his enemies, that Christ died for them and that we need to demonstrate a life transformed by the gospel, and that we would count on you to fight our battles for us, and that our response would be according to your word. Father, I ask now, especially for the, that you be with the small family. Lord, please surround them with your love. Comfort them as they bury, uh, their, uh, as they bury Jerry. Um, Lord, please, I pray that your spirit uh, would bring them comfort as they grieve and as they mourn. Uh, I pray that there would be a reflection on the godly life that you gave Jerry Small, uh, that they would be encouraged to live faithfully as he lived. Uh, Father, please, I pray that Liberty Baptist Church would surround uh, the family with love and compassion. Father, I pray for all the healthcare workers out there, the, the people who are the EMTs bringing people in and out of the hospitals, the nurses that have to work so closely with the patients in the hospitals and the nursing homes. Oh, Father, please protect them. I pray that uh, that you would strengthen them physically, give them wisdom to take care of uh, those in need. Um, Father, I pray uh, that you would be glorified through this pandemic, uh, that the gospel would spread through it. Father, we, we need you today. We need you to work in our lives supernaturally so that we can obey your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good day.